right. Got a couple minutes to go here until seven. Get our setup all good. I'm gonna open up the chat bar. I see a bunch of you already coming into the room here. So I'm just gonna say hello to make sure that those of you who are already in can see me and can hear me. Okay, hi, hello. All right, so as you're all starting to come into the room, if you wanna say hello on the side, a couple of you have already uh, done so to let me know that you can see me and hear me. I just wanna um, make it clear as well too, I cannot actually see you. So oftentimes people are afraid to interact or to post anything because they think as soon as they enter something in the sidebar that then they're gonna pop up on the screen for other people to see. It's, it's not going to happen. Um, I don't have your videos up, so you're all good. You could be wearing whatever you'd like right now. I have no idea, neither does anyone else. Exactly. All right. Okay, so we are seven o'clock on the dot. I like to be um, really punctual with these to respect your time and to make sure that we can utilize the time, hi Laura, that we have here together to talk about uh, so many of these fantastic questions that have been submitted. And so this is, I started this a couple of months ago where once a month I've been offering these free masterclasses to be able to compile the most common questions that women were sending in to me that they were struggling with. And I think there's about 13 that I have tonight that I'm going to aim to get through over the course of the next hour or so. And I'm going to create the opportunity for some Q&A as well. Now, I just want to preface this, first of all, by introducing myself. So my name is Jen Pike. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a registered holistic nutritionist and medical exercise specialist. And I actually specialize in the holistic industry in women's health and hormones. So uh, the base of everything that I teach upon is the digestive system and work our way up into the endocrine system. And I am the author of three books, The Simplicity Project, Simplicity Kitchen, and The Simplicity Body, and the creator of The Hormone Project. And the reason that I love doing these so much is because we no longer live in a period of time where we don't have access to information. We have so much accessibility now between Instagram and Facebook and the internet and Google and books and whatever else it may be to be looking for the you know answers to the problems that we are dealing with but what ends up happening too often is that we take in way too much information and then we can't figure out for ourselves well what's my next step that I need to take for me as the individual and so I also need to say that I can't do on the spot consultations. Those are, you know, that's a, that's a deep dive and you really want to work with a practitioner who's not just going to give you offhand um, suggestions when it comes to some critical things. Like a lot of people sent in information about bioidentical hormones and dosing of certain things. That's not something that we could ever go through on a webinar that you could then take, you know, to the bank or to the store to go and purchase for yourself. So keep in mind that for certain things, you will have to work with a practitioner. And I'm not saying that it's me, but whether it's a naturopath or a holistic nutritionist or a functional medicine doctor or a homeopath or whomever it may be, there will be some things that are brought up tonight where I will say to you, my next best step for you or suggestion would be to work with this type of person who specializes in that. So here we go. I'm going to dive right in. I've actually made a list of all of the questions um, so that I can not forget any of them. And then, like I said, I'll open it up for um, Q&A as well, too. So the first question that came into me, um, it was actually, it said my question coming up for your session is twofold, but it was really like fourfold. So the first question that this woman had was, what are the signs and symptoms of estrogen dominance? So estrogen dominance is a term that gets um, thrown around all lot. I would say that most women who come into the hormone project assume that they have estrogen dominance because I think a lot of women believe that when anything is out of whack, it's their estrogen or it's their cortisol, right? Those are the two main areas that women think, well, that must be what's going on. 
So let's break down what those signs and symptoms that you physically, mentally, and emotionally would be feeling when it comes to estrogen dominance or excess estrogen in your body. And what that means is, is that you're either producing too much estrogen, you're not eliminating your estrogen well enough, or it's unbound, meaning there's not enough progesterone or testosterone to help to balance that out, or you're doing a really poor job of detoxifying the estrogen in your system, you're not methylating, you're not eliminating, and so it's recirculating and causing problems. What would those problems be? Heavy, painful periods, irregular periods, long periods, really painful breast tenderness, a lot of mood swings, horrible PMS, like where you just, this is a common one. Women will write in and say that week leading into my cycle, I just become a different person. I'm really snappy and I'm impatient and I'm moody and I'm just not, you know, fun to be around and I can feel it, but I feel like I can't control it. I'm bloated. I have weight gain. I get headaches. I'm constipated. And this is really in those seven to 10 days in that luteal phase that's leading into the actual menstrual cycle. So those are a lot of the main signs and symptoms that are associated with excess estrogen. Now, the part two of this woman's question was, is endometriosis um, something that is, like she said, will it always manifest as something diagnosable like endometriosis, or can it just be an imbalance resulting in symptoms? So no, and here's something to understand. Endometriosis is associated with high estrogen, but that's not necessarily the cause of endometriosis. Endometriosis is an inflammatory condition that affects the whole body, primarily the uterus, but oftentimes moves up into the bladder and into the bowels. It is extremely painful. And what researchers now know is that in this last year, they are now considering endometriosis to be more of an autoimmune-based condition, meaning that it is microbial. It its origin is in the gut and the intestinal system, and that women who have endometriosis, when tested, they have really high levels of gram-negative bacteria in their pelvic microbiome. And these toxins play a huge role in the development of this illness, of this disease. And this is not something that, you know, unfortunately, medically, a lot of women who are diagnosed with endometriosis, they get told to go on the birth control pill, to go on an IUD, whether it be a synthetic hormone IUD, like the Mirena IUD or a copper IUD. And it really just puts a Band-Aid on top of the issue that's going on. It does not solve anything for these women. It oftentimes makes things a whole lot worse, especially when at some point they need to come off of that birth control pill or have the IUD removed. Um, this also can lead to a lot of issues with copper toxicity in the body and copper pushes estrogen, right? Copper takes our testosterone in our bodies and it actually converts it through something called aromatization into more potent estrogen. So these synthetic Band-Aid solutions that we are being recommended as women, like the pill and like IUDs, when we have heavy, painful periods, irregular cycles, all these different symptoms that I went through, this is not actually helping anything. These are, like I said, Band-Aid solutions, and these are the types of recommendations that we want to shift away from. And so one of the things that I would recommend is that you need to work with a practitioner who will do a full workup. So you want to have your regular updated pap smear years, ladies. I can't stress this enough. But by the time our body is physically producing signs and symptoms, internally things have been building for quite some time. So staying on top of your regular pap smears, asking for the results, not just, you know, being okay with the doctor's office saying, well, if nothing comes up, then we just won't get in touch with you. I always call and make sure that I get a hard copy of my results and then getting full blood work and asking for a full hormone panel. So unfortunately with blood work, it's only going to give us a portion of what we need to know for our hormonal health. And I'm going to talk about this right off the top at the beginning of our conversation tonight, because you'll see that it's a common thread throughout the answers to the other questions that I'm going to give you. And so if you want to have a pen and paper and write this down and remember that again, I'm recording this and you're all going to get an email copy. But here's the key hormone test you want to ask for. Now, in blood work, they can't measure every hormone. I'm going to tell you the other two tests that can do that. So in your typical blood work, now again, I'm Canadian. I live in Ontario. So I am most well-versed with what our um, requisitions are here. 
a lot around the world now because we have women in nearly 20 countries that are participating in the hormone project and we're working with different teams all across the world to understand what we can ask for, what is in their jurisdiction. So you're going to get a full hematology. They're going to look at, you know, red blood cell, white blood cell, you know, your hematocrits, your hemoglobin, ferritin, those types of things. You want to understand what's going on with your glucose, fasting glucose. You want to understand what's going on with your HbA1c. This is going to tell us a little bit more about your blood sugar. We want to get cholesterol measured. When it comes to the hormones, first area here is we're going to talk about the reproductive sex hormones. So the only one that they will measure out of your estrogens, you produce three. The only one they're going to measure in your blood work is called estradiol. Okay, so estradiol is what you want to get tested in your blood progesterone, testosterone, DHEA. Now, when you go and test your uh, progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone, when we're trying to see the balance of those three, you need to be tested between typically day 18 and 22. Now, those values are based off a 28-day cycle. If you don't have a 28-day cycle, like I do not, I have a 26-day cycle. So for me, I test two days earlier than what they recommend, because really what we're trying to capture is to get the blood work done about five to seven days before the onset of your menstrual cycle, or, or five to seven days after ovulation has happened, so that we can ensure you're actually ovulating. Because if you don't ovulate, you do not produce progesterone. And this could be one of the reasons that you have this excess amount of estrogen is because you don't have enough progesterone to help to balance and stabilize that. The other area that you want to be asking for in your blood work is a full thyroid panel. Now, ladies, I know that you probably haven't been told this before, and maybe you have, and this is a reminder, but if you have issues going on with inflammation in your body, digestively, with your reproductive sex hormones, so your menstrual cycle, your libido, your energy, your sleep, all of those things, you have to get your thyroid fully tested. And getting TSH tested is not a full thyroid test. In fact, TSH is not a thyroid test at all. It is a marker called thyroid stimulating hormone. It is produced in your brain by your pituitary gland, and it sends a signal to your thyroid gland that is like knocking on the door that says, hey there thyroid, okay, now I need you to produce T4, which is inactive, and T3, which is the metabolic active form of the hormone, so the thyroid's gonna produce these. Your liver then steps in to have to convert more of this T3 into the active form that your cells can use. Every receptor in your body, your metabolic system, your energy, hair growth, all of this. And you also wanna get tested. So free T4, free T3, reverse T3, because if your reverse T3 is high, this is another marker of inflammation. And high reverse T3 will block your body's active form of the thyroid hormone. So it's, your body could be producing it, could be converting it, but if your reverse T3 is up, you have no way of getting it inside of the cells, and so your body's going to start to suffer. Energy's going to drop. Body weight is going to be an issue for you. You won't be able to lose it. Constipation, hair growth is going to slow down. Eyebrows are going to thin. You're going to start to have a lot of issues where, think about it, when the thyroid starts to slow down, everything slows down in your body. Um, and then the other two areas that I would look into are your thyroid antibodies. So that is TPO and TGAB, thyroid peroxidase and thyroid antiglobulin. And these are really important to request because if we suspect and you have a lot of symptoms digestively that are going on, a lot of inflammatory issues that are showing up in your body, we want to rule out, is your immune system involved in this? Because more than 90% of women that are dealing with a thyroid issue, whether it be an underactive or overactive, it is actually autoimmune in nature. And there's a very different protocol that we would take with somebody who has elevated antibodies that's triggering the destruction of their thyroid tissue and thyroid function than there would be for somebody who has an under or overactive thyroid strictly due to some lifestyle factors that we need to clean up. So does that make sense in terms of what I'm recommending for that type of, to me, that is like baseline testing. I don't like any less than that. And when women come into my practice, we help them get those tests. So if their doctor won't agree to it, which a lot of the times they won't, because you have to create a case for yourself. You have to actually prove, you know, why you feel it necessary, what you've been going through that would deem it 
um, necessary to do those testing. And so if your family doctor won't agree to it, then we help to connect you with a naturopath or functional medicine practitioner who can help to fill in those gaps. Um, and then what we do is we help you to understand, we actually pull up all your blood work in a video like this right now and take you through every single result of your blood work so you start to understand your data your chemistry so that you can begin to connect the dots. I'm really huge on, that's why I do these things, educating you and not just telling you. Because if you come away from this and you don't understand what we spoke about and it wasn't explained to you in a clear enough way, well, then what was the point of this? So it's why I also encourage you to use the chat bar on the side when I say to you, okay, I'm going to open it up for questions or, hey, did that make sense how I just described that so that I know and can make sure that we're on the right track. So first opportunity. Did what I just described to you make sense? Do you understand why you really need to be getting these baseline tests done so that we can have a bigger picture of what's going on? Question time's great because I also get to take a sip of water. There's dozens of you on here right now. So Taryn, um, as I said when I was saying it, this is, gonna, this is all recorded. So when you get the record and in the email, you'll be able to write down all of those tests. Okay, all right, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next part of the question. Awesome, thanks, Laura. Okay, so um, the next question that she asked within this is, and this leads to what I was just talking about actually, if your hormone levels haven't been checked and you don't have a proven hormone imbalance or if blood work came back is quote unquote normal, is it still safe to take certain supplements like chromium, um, alpha lipoic acid, myonositol, and DIM? Okay, so first of all, what I would say is go back and listen to what I just talked to about blood work for hormones. Um, to be honest with you, blood work is not, I will get it done for clients, but I prefer when we're talking about hormones to do a test called the Dutch test, and it's an acronym. It's not Dutch, it's not European, it's from the, from the States. And it stands for Dried Urinary uh, Total Comprehensive Hormones. And so this is a 14-page report of findings that you um, urinate four, sometimes five times throughout a 24-hour period. If you wake up in the middle of the night, you have to pee on the strip at that time. And um, I typically have a strip hanging around here to show you, but I don't see one right now. And so when these results come back, it's going to tell us all three of your estrogens, your estrogen metabolic pathways, your progesterone, all of your androgens, how you break those hormones down. It'll tell us your adrenal health that's going on, your melatonin, which is your key sleep hormone, your inflammatory markers, your neurotransmitters, organic acids. And it honestly, I describe it as like a woman. It is like having the pot of gold at the end of the hormone rainbow. It's like that thing that just feels so elusive, having the answers to these things that are going on in your body. And when you get this, and if we have it, and it's lined up next to your blood work or any additional type of testing, all of a sudden it's like all the dots start to connect and you go, okay. And we cross reference, like how my brain works is when I get these kind of results back from clients and I'm working with a woman, it's like, I pull away from it. And there's like this huge flow chart. And I literally have like post-its in front of me with all their signs and symptoms, everything that that human being, that woman has described to me about what's been going on in her body and how she's been feeling and you know, how this is interfering with her day-to-day -day life the whole health history. This is another really important thing to understand that when you're going and getting tests done is one thing, but A, if you're not working with somebody who can help you understand the test, B, if you're not taking into account, like what's the whole life that you've lived up to the now of when you're doing the testing? You know, what was your mother's pregnancy like with you inside of her body? What was that environment like? How was your childhood? Were you on lots of medication? Were you healthy? What did you eat? What was in your environment? What about as you got older and as a teen? How was your menstrual cycle? And what issues were you going on with there? Were you ever on birth control or medication for your skin or digestive issues going on? You know, how has your body historically responded to stress? You know, have you ever been pregnant? What were your pregnancies like? Have you ever had viruses and bacteria? Material issues like mono, Epstein Barr virus, which that is. Did you suffer from strep a lot? Like all of these things are, they're referred to as stealth infections. They are working up the history of our body. They're what's impacting our immune system, our cellular function, all of that. And then what starts to happen is the body becomes weakened over time, or you have a stressful situation in life that happens. 
happens, something that you weren't prepared for, or you have been ignoring it for a really long time until the, the signs and the knocks on the door start to become pounding fists and you know screaming and alarms going off to get your attention that something's really out of balance. So when someone says to me, I'm told I'm fine, I don't feel fine, but the doctor said I'm fine, or I don't feel fine, but all my tests came back normal, I'm like, first of all, what we do is we dig deeper. You've got to dig deeper. I would never say to somebody, just jump right into the supplements because number one, you are going to waste time. You're going to waste a lot of money and you could potentially make things worse if we don't actually know what we are trying to bridge in terms of, do you actually have deficiencies in these areas and need these supplements? Are you having a hard time methylating or detoxifying estrogen, which is why we would put you on something like DIM in the first place? Is blood sugar an issue, which is why you would use chromium and inositol? So you really need to understand, first of all, what is actually going on and then work on the lifestyle piece, the nutritional piece, the things that aren't, you know, in a capsule and in a bottle yet. Work on those elements so that we can lift the fog off your system. Because once you're eating better, if we can help your body manage stress response a bit better, get you resting better, change up some of your products, a couple of those things, get your lymph system moving, maybe we start to diminish your symptoms by even 20, 25%, which then once the top irritating things are gone, it's like you've been treading forever and you finally get to come up and take like a full breath of air or you put your feet down and you're like, oh, I had no idea it was this shallow and I didn't have to tread the whole time. And you actually get to kind of stand up and anchor yourself and then go, okay, so now all I'm dealing with are these symptoms. And then that's when we can become far more focused on what you need to do for your body. Does that make sense how I'm explaining that? So I am definitely not one. I mean, there's foundational supplements that I think that we should all be on. I write about these, talk about them all the time. Um, you know, in my book, The Simplicity Project, like your magnesium, your vitamin D, your omegas, probiotics. I think women really should be on a good quality B complex, um, a whole food whole food, like I don't even like to call this supplements, but things like a greens powder um, or juice plus or something like that so that you're getting those phytonutrients back into your body. But beyond that, things for increasing or decreasing estrogen and testosterone or supporting progesterone, you, you really need to be careful because like I used to, if you had come and talked to me a couple of years ago, um, I used to use certain supplements all the time for women who I thought were dealing with excess estrogen. And then as I started to do all of the Dutch testing, what I realized is maybe they had an issue with their estrogen detox, but they actually didn't have high estrogen itself. So their estrogen was normal or low, but they weren't able to actually get it out of their body. And so old estrogen was just sitting there retoxing their system, which was causing the sore boobs and the PMS and the weight gain and the really horrible period periods. And so instead of giving them something that was working on lowering their estrogen, which was making them feel shittier sometimes, I started to focus on, let's just go after phase one detox pathways. Let's get you pooping. Let's just focus on that. Digest your food, get rid of the gas and bloating, get you pooping every single day really well. And those results just like amplified, you know, it's just, it, it's been like the most beautiful thing to witness and see, but this is why we test and we don't guess. And the thing is, is like, you have to understand this too. I mean, even us as practitioners, you are the journey of health. You are forever a student. You are always learning. There's always information that's changing. And it's actually a wonderful thing. If you can allow yourself to be open enough to A, being patient and realizing that you're not going to change the way you're feeling in 30 days or you know three months sometimes, depending on how long this has been going on and what's going on. Um, you know, I say to most women, I really need you to wrap your head around investing the next six to 18 months, like on the subject and project of you, like you have to be the number one priority right now. Okay. Um, and then the, the last part of this was asking about bioidentical creams, progesterone specifically. So this is the most common question that I get when it comes to bioidentical hormones, um, is asking about whether or not I should use uh, a cream, a progesterone based cream, if I have excess estrogen. So no, we don't treat excess estrogen by just giving you more progesterone. Do you know what will happen if you do that first? You will bloat, you will put weight on. I have seen it happen, like literally women putting on 10 pounds in a couple of weeks. 
you have to look at why the estrogen is is being displaced or is the issue in the first place and then work you've got to like reverse engineer it sometimes like i'm not against bioidentical hormones at all but they're not the first line of, of defense or healing in the journey for women you've got to do the actual lifestyle nutritional sleep that kind of work first then you can start to look at now do I still need some additional hormones via bioidentical creams, you know, or oil, oral or suppository, and then you work with a practitioner. They're not FDA regulated. So there's no like one size fits all. You have to work with someone who's using a compounding pharmacy and your dosage would not be like anybody else. It would be specific to your levels that they would test and measure. And then they would create a specific, uh, Okay, so we just had a power surge <laughs> that shut our internet and everything down. So I am back. Are you still here and can you hear me and see me? Here, awesome. Okay, thank you for waiting. <laughs> Not too sure it happened there. We don't even have a storm or anything, but all the power just shut down and then the kids were screaming because my husband's at a hockey meeting and, uh, and then I had to reboot. All right, I'm fairly certain I think I was talking about something to do with stress. So that's kind of stressful when that happens. That was just the universe giving a little joke for all of us. Um, so I was talking about things with progesterone. So here's what I will say in terms of that is in order to support your progesterone naturally, because like I said, my, my route would never be to put you on a bioidentical um, right away. And so some things you can do is number one is focus on trying to maintain or attain a healthy body weight. If you've got excess weight on your body, this is gonna cause your body to be producing more estrogen right within those fat cells. And that can be contributing to that hormonal imbalance. So working at reducing inflammatory triggers. So this is where looking at like, what are the foods that you are consuming? So our nutrition is not something that we can like you can't outsmart it. It's not about not eating carbohydrates and only eating protein and vegetables. Uh, you know, it's not about drinking six liters of water a day and living off of green smoothies. And it really truly is about finding a balance that's going to be sustainable for you. And this is something where I'm coaching women on all the time is a lot of, so many of us, like I have felt this before too, especially being part of this industry, have a level of a disordered relationship with our food. We're afraid of so many types of foods that we think that's going to be the thing that's going to make us gain weight, but we're still drinking the alcohol. We're still having the sweets. You know, we're still having these massive gaps of time without eating and creating a dieter's mentality when we need to be looking at, am I nourishing and supporting my body? Am I nourishing and supporting my hormones? Protein, fat, and fiber at each meal, eating three good meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and possibly a snack in the afternoon, I have found to be the most successful approach for women to feel satiated, to balance their key hunger and satiation hormones, leptin and ghrelin, and to help to have a better support team on the inside for their estrogen, the progesterone, and testosterone. When I watch women and they really deplete their carbohydrates or they're not getting um, a good source of protein in, their thyroid suffers, their minerals suffer. And you see the hair loss, you see the you know more inflammation happening, you see the low energy. And so really taking a closer look at what is the food you're putting into your body. The other thing when it comes to progesterone is your exercise. So if you are exercising too intensely or too excessively, this is going to have you pumping out a higher amount of cortisol. And when your cortisol is elevated, this is going to discourage the production of your progesterone. Remember, progesterone happens as a result of ovulating. If you have all of the sensors going off in your body, like there is stress happening 24-7 and there is a ton of 
cortisol that is being produced excessively, that's not a safe environment for your body. And your body's smart. Your body, yes, as women, you know, we are naturally um, designed to be able to procreate life, but only in the right conditions. If your body perceives any level of stress or danger, your body is going to say, look, I know that we're supposed to release an egg each month and ovulate and then produce progesterone so you could possibly get pregnant, but this is not a safe space and environment. The stress level's too high in here. We have nutrient deficiencies. We have inflammation and other triggers that are going on, and you don't actually need your menstrual cycle this month in order to survive, so I am actually going to start to tweak and teeter with that because I need to use some of that energy for other things in your body. You also don't need to have that healthy head of hair and the growing nails. You know, put a hat on that head and put a sweater on if you're cold and slap on some fake nails. Your body's just like those aren't priorities right now in order to keep you alive. And so then you have to ask yourself, what can I do to make this home feel as safe as possible? So not exercising excessively. When you are exercising, ladies, especially if you're rebounding from a tremendous amount of stress and progesterone has been low, your periods have been getting shorter, you uh, have meaning like the actual length of bleed is getting shorter, the length in between your cycles is getting shorter, you're starting to notice a lot of the things that I've talked about, you really need to ask yourself, am I doing too much cardio? Can I cut back on that? Can I just start to walk? Can you walk, do yoga, Pilates? You know, when you are going to work out, strength training is going to be fantastic. It's going to help to support your DHEA and your testosterone as well, too. So it is reshaping so much of how we are educated nowadays on the things that we need to do for our body. I can pretty much guarantee you everything you read in the cashier's line on the magazine covers for all of those key magazines really are not the things that you need to be listening to. It's very few and far between uh, when I see those and I write for one of those magazines um, in their online publications and I can see there's a trend of, of helping women understand now more and more, but for the most of them, the other magazines, it's just the same, it's the same articles every single month, same suggestions every month and no one's getting any better. So reducing your stress is critical for your progesterone and zinc, getting enough zinc rich foods. So these are things like your raw nuts and seeds, um, your healthy grass fed, organic, free range, hormone free meats. Um, so, you know, I do a lot of work with women who, and I was a full blown vegetarian for many, many years. I was vegan and then raw vegan um, up until the time that I was 26 when I got pregnant with my first child. And then that's when I, um, I just knew intuitively and then felt the difference physically that that no longer was serving my body. Um, and so I work with a lot of women who are, you know, vegetarian or not getting any animal based products in who are dealing with copper toxins toxicity and who are really struggling to get in the right amount of amino acids. And I'm not saying it's impossible because it's not, it is possible, but it, you have to make sure that you understand how to balance out what you're eating. So your body is getting all of the nutrients that you need. And if you're not into eating those products, that's fine. But like I said, then just make sure you're educating yourself on what you need to get, get in enough legumes so that you're getting those things. And if you're doing animal products, then outside of the meats, it's your eggs, it's your fish, and then loads of vegetables, right? Vegetables are chock full of zinc. And that mineral is responsible for helping to control your pituitary gland, which is producing a series of crucial reproductive hormones, right? Not just for your thyroid, but for your adrenals and for your ovaries. And so if you don't have enough zinc, if you don't have enough healthy fat, if you don't have enough healthy fiber into your body, it's going to slow the production of these hormones, including that progesterone. Um, and as I said in the beginning, a good quality B complex is going to be really important as well too. Another question I had here was about, um, this is from a woman who said, where is hers here? Uh, I had the Dutch testing done, high estrogen was the result, and cortisol stuff. I'm taking a supplement to metabolize the extra prescribed by my naturopath. My PMS symptoms are awful since I turned 40 a couple of years ago, and they run the entire week before the new moon when I start my cycle. My breasts are sore and swollen, and I'm so bloated from being constipated it is the worst. What can I change in my diet to deal with this? And tips on remembering to do these things. 
Okay, so that is a really good point because I think we hear a lot of suggestions and then we, where we struggle is actually putting it into action because it oftentimes feels like so many things you have to change. You will notice by the end of our time together that I'm gonna give you probably a lot of the same recommendations, um, just slightly tweaked. So for this one, my first tip would be um, there's a couple different things going on. The fact that you've had a high estrogen and cortisol result come back, I'd be working more closely with your naturopath on these PMS symptoms because you've got the, the chemistry from your testing that, that's showing what's happening, and then you've got the physical symptoms. Um, and this wouldn't just be supplemental based. So working with somebody intimately to help to get you on the right protocol, eliminating the big triggers. So the big triggers for that estrogen imbalance, the PMS, the breast tenderness and that are going to be stimulants. So it's going to be alcohol. Alcohol is super high in estrogen. Okay. So cutting the alcohol out, reducing your amount of coffee. If you are going to have it, choose like a mushroom based coffee Four Sigmatic is a great company or a dandy blend, which is working on your liver, which is where you detox and metabolize all of that estrogen, cut your sugar, get the dairy out. The A1 casein in dairy ladies is going to flare your symptoms like nobody's business. It's going to contribute to your acne, to your headaches, the breast tenderness, the inflammation, the joint pain massively to the constant patient. So chuck that dairy to the curb. If you, when you, I would do it completely with cow dairy. So yes, you have to say goodbye to your Greek yogurt, which everybody just, you know, thinks is the best source of protein. Meanwhile, it's causing so many of these issues in your body. And after you've given yourself about a month off of it completely, you could tether in small bits of sheep or goat cheese or yogurt, but not getting back into the routine of doing it every single day. Um, you could use like coconut yogurt as a replacement or um, cashew or almond yogurt as a replacement. And then there is umpteen different non dairy milk alternatives that you could be using. Um, and then gluten is obviously going to be a big one. And for anyone who has the big digestive issues and they have thyroid issues in conjunction with some of these hormonal things showing up, gluten is going to be a massive, massive pain in your ass. And it is going to get in the way every single time. And listen, nowadays to be gluten-free is actually quite easy. It's not about going and buying every gluten-free product under the sun. It's using things that never had gluten in them in the first place. That's going to be the easiest way for you to do this. And then filling your plate with, you know, if you always had pasta or rice or a flour-based option or white potatoes, you want to look to more of your vegetables, your dark leafy greens. You want to, you know, roast up, you know, broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts or leeks and zucchini and peppers and, um, you know, sweet potato squash, all of those different things. And you probably need a digestive enzyme to help you if you have been having more of the starchy carbohydrates and less of the vegetables. Yes, the fiber is going to be great for your body. It's going to chelate bind to the toxins, the toxic SX, excess estrogen to help you poop it out. But if you aren't used to this and your stomach acid has been low and you've been suffering from the burping and the belching and the constipation, you could create a bit of a butt plug and a bit of a bomb on the inside. So digestive enzymes before your um, meals would be excellent and getting a lot of really good quality water into your body as well too. Um, sleep is going to be another massive one. So sleep is where all of your healing and your repairing happens. This is where the system gets to shut down. I would also advise in this case of having having the really bad PMS, that you do practice about a 12 to 14 hour digestive rest overnight. So if you're going to bed, say at 10 o'clock, um, no, this is not just for women who are menstruating, Belinda, this would be like in general, because women who are in menopause and beyond, again, we've done such an unjust um, thing by having them believe that when you no longer have a period, none of this information applies to you. The bleed is just part of it. You still go through four phases and rhythms every single month based on the moon and the lunar cycle. Now you still have these hormones in your body. Your ovaries have slowed down their production, but your adrenals are still converting and creating the liver is still working for you. Some of your fat cells are still producing it and I'll get to that. So the information I'm talking about here, this is like female wide. It doesn't matter at this point whether or not you still have your menstrual cycle. The difference is the woman who's suffering with this who has a period, her symptoms are going to show up leading into the period itself. The woman who no longer has a period, hers are going to show up with her insomnia, vaginal dryness, hot flashes, weight gain, cravings, mood swings, anxiety, depression, and no sex drive. Um, okay, so let's keep going.
All right. Um, and then exercise is another one for this. So, uh, well, sorry, let me go back to what I was just saying there about the food. So if you're going to bed at 10 o'clock at night, which I hope that is the latest you're going to bed, and I'm gonna explain why in a moment, I would not be eating past about seven, 7.30 at the latest. I would have at least two and a half to three hours full digestive rest before going to bed. And then upon waking, if you got the constipation and the inflammation, when I woke up, I would be doing something like warm water with a bit of lemon and apple cider vinegar to get the digestive juices going. The warm water and lemon, lemon is super alkalizing to your liver, to your lymph and to your blood. And what the warm water is gonna do with this is it's going to encourage something called peristalsis, which is helping the muscles through the bowels contract to help to literally grab a hold of that fecal matter and help you eliminate better. And um, the other thing of that in your bathroom, if you don't already have it, is please start to put a stool under your feet. Your knees need to be at or above the height of your navel in order to create that compression to actually push your fecal matter up, across, and then down. Um, so with the, the sleep, the sleep is critical. Every hour of sleep you get before midnight is worth its weight in gold because it is the equivalent of two hours of sleep after midnight. And seven to nine hours is what we're aiming for, but 10 p.m. is really like 10 to 10.30. 10 until two, those are the most important time for your adrenals and your thyroid. And if you're somebody who constantly wakes up between you know, one and four in the morning, more closely to two and 3 a.m., you really need to pay attention to a lot of these things we're talking, you're welcome, Melinda, talking about tonight because two to 3 a.m. is a critical time for blood sugar and liver. If you're waking consistently at those times in the middle of the night, that's a probably big indication that your last meal of the day wasn't balanced. Could be an indication that all the meals throughout the day weren't balanced enough. Um, I know a lot of the women I work with at night, they'll have like a bowl of cereal or popcorn or they have something sweet uh, leading into where they're drinking alcohol at dinner or having a glass of wine after dinner. And then they tell me that they're up and they can't get back to sleep in the middle of the night. And there's a few different reasons that happens, but one of the biggest is this blood sugar connection. So if you have these, you know, carbohydrate type things in the evening, if blood sugar is not stable, your insulin is going to spike at night in response to the alcohol, the popcorn, the chips, the cookies, whatever you have had. And then when you go to sleep, your blood sugar is going to drop. When your blood sugar drops, your body recognizes this as being dangerous. And so your body will actually start to increase cortisol to try to pull glycogen, which is stored glucose, stored sugar out of your liver to get it into your bloodstream and into your body to pick your blood sugar back up to, to protect you. Because if your blood sugar goes too low when you're sleeping, you go into a coma. This is what happens to diabetics, okay? This is why managing blood sugar is so critical. Problem is, is that you're not at the risk of going into a coma. You just had something that was, you know, insulin and cortisol spiking before bed, or you stayed up too late, or you were on electronics, or there was bright lights around you, and that cortisol was jacked instead of lowering down. It stimulated this response in your body. And now when it wakes you at two or three in the morning, you wake up, you think you have to go pee because why the heck else would you wake up in the middle of the night? You stand up. That process then sends a message to your body like, okay, we're, we're up. It wasn't a very long sleep, but we're up. So my job is when you start to wake up and there's motion and we see light that I need to actually double our cortisol production within that first, you know, half an hour to 60 minutes of being awake. And you've given me the sign of standing up. You actually walk to the bathroom. You are probably seeing light so that you don't fall into the toilet. And so now you've started to create all of these signals to your body, like it's wake up time. So these levels have started to increase. Now you lie back into bed and you're exhausted. You want to go back to sleep and you start to toss and turn. And it takes you a few hours to finally fall back asleep. And the reason being is you have to wait now for those hormones for cortisol and insulin to start to slowly lower themselves back down so that melatonin can surge up again and you can fall back asleep. And most women that I work with in my practice, they'll describe their sleep to me like this and say, and you know what, Jen, I'll finally fall back asleep around 4, 4.30. And then I sleep until my alarm goes off for work the next day. And that's my best hours of sleep. And these women are literally living off that small amount of sleep. And this is part of the reason as to why so many of these issues are happening in their body.
Can any of you relate to that? And does that make sense how I just describe what it is that's going on? So for me, I love to get women to stop eating two to three hours before they go to bed and then start with something, you know, like that warm water and lemon in the morning, maybe a dandy blend elixir, which I share tons of those. Um, and I have them in my cookbooks and on my website, but it's, it's, these are like the little things. I'm not telling you to run out and buy a supplement. I'm talking to you about your habits and your routines, back up your eating, change what you're eating, change the thing you drink first thing in the morning. And you'd be amazed at having like that 12 hour window. So if you ate dinner at 6.30 at night, you're not gonna consume anything else until at least 6.30 in the morning. That means half your day, your body is getting the chance to rest and digest, which is where healing happens. This is where it does its work. So this isn't about intermittent fasting for weight loss and for any of those things. I'm talking about it purely from a regenerative perspective in your body body. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move on. Now, the thing about remembering, you have to create stations for yourself. So when it comes to remembering to drink water, you have to have your water nearby your desk, your car, taking supplements, have some near your kettle, have some near your blender, put some near your toothbrush. Where do you go often that you can remember to do these things? Now, the next question is about recurring ovarian cysts and treatment options. I'm seeing a gynecologist in October and they're suspecting endometriosis. The pain is unbearable. Okay, so first of all, I am really sorry that you've been going through this. Um, most likely what will happen in this situation if they do think that it's endometriosis is they'll talk to you about things like an IUD, birth control pill, medication like um, Fizan, or surgery. What I would recommend is to get a second opinion, to dig a little bit deeper, to do some additional testing outside of the intravaginal and ultrasounds that they would do. And I would get a SIBO test done, which is a breath test, because almost always when there are um, chronic issues of fibroid cyst and possibly endometriosis or adenomyosis, that SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, could be part of the issue. A lot of women for a lot of time were told that they had IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. It, mo most people now are being truly diagnosed as to what it is, which is SIBO. And this is where bacterial elements move high up into the small intestine where they're not supposed to be. And this causes a lot of duress digestively, but it also moves some of that bacteria into that uterine area that we were talking about earlier, which can contribute to things like endometriosis. Um, and there's some additional testing as well too that can be done like a GI map which is actually testing the stool itself. Um, the Dutch test would help to understand furthermore what it is that's going on with um, with the body but I would definitely definitely look a little deeper and then I would start off by eliminating the triggers that I mentioned above and one thing that's really helpful with fibroids and cysts and if it is endometriosis is a FODMAP diet. So in the hormone project um, you have not nine different meal plans to choose from in the different protocols. And one of them is FODMAP based because so many women now are dealing with this SIBO endometrial connection. And um, it's really just become rampant. Is there a hormonal imbalance reason that causes recurring urinary tract infections? Yeah, there is. So again, this would be what's going on in the vaginal microbiome. Blood sugar is a big connection to this as well. And then taking a deeper look into what's actually going on um, with, the, with the actual hormones, with your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Um, so UTIs, there is actually, I mean, this is like a, a very small step you could take in this direction, but there's a great probiotic that um, Genuine Health created, and it is specific for the vaginal microbiome. And it's oral that you take, uh, and it says it actually says UTI on it. The other thing you can use is something called D-Manos, M-A-N-N-O-S-E, D-Manos, instead of antibiotics. Because the problem is, is that urinary tract infections, um, they give antibiotic after antibiotic, which just weakens your system, decreases your resiliency, and leaves you more apt to then have a UTI that's followed by a yeast infection or excessive discharge, and then followed by another UTI. So d is excellent, that probiotic by Genuine Health, and then Genestra actually makes vaginal suppository probiotics that are an ovule. So it looks like how you'd use a tampon applicator 
and it's a probiotic. It's like a, a little ovule, a little oval shape, and you would insert it vaginally before you go to bed. And then I'd say like wear a panty liner because as it breaks down, there'll be some, um, you know, like discharge that comes out. And so you would take the probiotics, the d orally, you would then vaginally insert those probiotics and within a couple of days, things are going to calm down. So again, there, there's lots of different things. Um, that can be used for that before running to take an antibiotic because one of the big reasons that we have so many of these issues going on is too much medication which leads into the next question which is about acne so this woman wrote in saying why do i have so much acne it's on my chin my jaw my chest and my back but my diet is clean i don't understand why i'm suffering so i actually just did a post about this yesterday on androgenic acne and the acne and i used to suffer from this i never had it on my body but i had it on my chin and jawline and around my mouth. Um, more recently when I did um, a big cleanup um, and I was doing some different testing, I had it on my forehead. Um, and so I've definitely gone through this. And this is typically due, especially in this area, chest and back to the higher androgens. So you need to go there and read that because I talked about what's happening with levels of DHEA and testosterone and how this is impacting our sebaceous glands and the amount of sebum and bacteria that we're producing. And when we're getting, you know, pimples and this type of acne, these aren't like little tiny things. These are things that are growing under underneath the skin surface for a period of time and they spread and there's because there is a hormonal connection but also bacterial so cleaning up diet blood sugar wise and then there's other key supplements and things that I talk about in that post so I would head on over to my Instagram feed Jen Pike and read that post that I wrote yesterday about that um, and one thing I would say is be careful with topical treatments so salicylic acid benzoyl peroxide they might look like they're helping in the beginning Beginning, but they're going to dry everything out. The drying out is then going to tell your body that it needs to produce more oil. So oil cleansing method, getting rid of, you know, really drying bars of soap and those types of things is also going to be a step in that right direction. Next question, my period is so heavy, I can't leave the house for the first two days. Okay, so that is not fun. And this is very common, but this is not normal. No woman should not be able to function for a couple of days because of her cycle. Everyone is going to feel off for your first one to two days. Like ladies, your uterus is contracting and shedding the lining of itself. It's not going, you're not going to be, you know, super energized and feeling like you want to take on the world. You're going to want to be in your, you know, stretchy pants and you're going to want to incubate. And so you should, but to be in that much pain or to have such a heavy flow that you say you cannot leave the house, that's not okay. So a couple things here. First thing is when was the last time that you had a pap smear done to rule out bigger issues? Because when there's heavy, excessive bleeding, Okay, so somebody else wrote into this saying that their cycles last 10 plus days, not normal, and that their doctor told them that they're fine, all the results have come back normal. That is not normal. There's something else going on. So it could be the excess estrogen. It could be an underactive thyroid. It could be a blood clotting issue that's going on. It could be fibroids polyps. It could be an ovulatory dysfunction. It could be endometriosis or adenomyosis. It could be due to a history of being on the birth control pill and part of a post birth control pill syndrome picture. It could be something more serious like PID, which is pelvic inflammatory disease or cancer. And so it's really important that we are doing the deep work and not just like, well, what supplement can I take? And you know, what food can I eat? Those things might help, but I would say we want to do our due diligence and make sure that we're actually investigating all of the scenarios first, getting that pap smear done. Second, getting appropriate blood work done. Third, working with a practitioner who can do a full medical health history intake with you, which at minimum should be an hour at minimum to really go through everything that is going on. The other issue is that if you have high levels of copper or you have low iron, right? It's like this, this vicious cycle for women who have heavy cycles. They get low iron because of the heavy cycle. Um, and so they're trying to do the things to increase their iron levels, but they're bloodletting every single month. And so again, there's different homeopathic remedies that can really be beneficial, different tinctures, herbs, and botanicals in conjunction with um, 
doing some of the testing to really figure out what's going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then cleaning up the diet. Okay. If you're that person that has these horribly painful periods and you just, you, you can't leave home and it's really impacting, you've got to look at what you're eating and get rid of any of the inflammatory triggers. What's your stress like? Can we work to help you manage that better? And then um, a tincture that I would recommend to help you is by a company called St. Francis. Now, this is not going to fix everything. This is going to help to manage the heavy bleeding so that we can give you some energy back and that we can give you some assistance while we're working on the bigger picture of what's going on. So it's called Shepherd's Purse. And St. Francis is my favorite brand for this. You can order it online uh, through purefeast.ca. You can actually enter the code St. Francis 10 and save 10% and they'll ship it to your house. You can also buy this at most of your health food stores. So St. Francis Herb Farm is the company um, and they're based out of Ontario and Shepherd's Purse is the tincture. And this is specifically for heavy menstrual cycles. I use this with women who have menorrhagia all the time with wonderful success. Um, my other suggestion to that, and this is any of you dealing with the heavy painful cycles, is please switch to natural feminine products. So if you're still using always Tampax, OB, you know, whatever kind of tampon or pad you can get your hands on, you have to understand that those companies use genetically modified bleached cotton that has dioxins all over it. And so this, when you're putting it against your actual vaginal tissue or inside your cervix, that this is off-gassing into the tissue of your vagina, into the rest of your body, your lymph system, and your bloodstream. So when we're talking about excess estrogen, we're talking about higher toxicity levels, this is a huge culprit. So switch to companies like NatraCare, switch to, I mean, there's a couple of different companies out there now, a menstrual cup, so Diva Cup, Athena, um, and not all cups are the same size. So if you have a low-lying cervix, you might need a smaller size cup. You can actually just go on and Google menstrual cup sizes and it'll give you different indications and charting and they're not expensive. And um, you know, I've been using a menstrual cup for years now and it was a total game changer um, for that. Okay. So next on the list, psoriasis postpartum with both kids. So I've actually worked with a couple of women who have had this as well too. Now, I don't know your specific case, but in, with these women, they had had previous skin issues. One had skin issues with eczema and psoriasis as a child and then went away forever. And during her pregnancy, her skin was fine. But this is common with pregnancy. We have this massive surge of hormones during pregnancy. And then when we give birth, and we also give birth to the placenta, not just our child, we have a massive drop in hormones. And that can throw many different things off. Now, psoriasis is actually immune related. So this is more of an autoimmune condition that's showing up in the skin with an issue with that skin cell turnover. And so I'd be working on your gut. I'd be working on really good, clean quality products for your body. And I'd be working on helping to rebalance some of those hormonal shifts that happen. So this would be a case where I would hope that there'd be some previous blood work that we could look at and see where you were at, what was going on, what's happening now. And then a Dutch test is something I would definitely recommend for this so that we could see where are the areas that we need to help you work on. Now, the next question was about hypothyroidism. Is there a certain number of carbohydrates you should eat if you have an underactive thyroid? Okay, so this is a really great question, and I think that this is prevalent to all of you listening because carbs are vilified. They are the number one macronutrient that everyone is prepared to just ditch and get rid of because we've been told to cut out gluten and to cut out flour. Now, cutting out gluten is one thing, but there are tons of carbohydrates that aren't even grain-based or flour-based or ever had gluten in it. Like all of your vegetables, your fruits, you have naturally non-glutinous grains. And the main reason why carbohydrates affect thyroid function so directly and why for people who cut their carbs drastically or all together, I've seen this happen with so many women who jumped into the keto craze without being really fully educated and working with someone is that they felt great until they didn't. 
and then their hair started to fall out and then their eyebrows started to thin and then they had no sex drive and then they just energy plummeted. They lost their period. So many things started to happen and their thyroid started to get thrown out of whack. And the reason is because insulin is needed for that conversion of inactive T4 thyroid hormone into the active T3 hormone. And typically for people who are on a very low carbohydrate diet, insulin tends to be quite low. And so if you've suddenly started to develop some hypothyroid symptoms, the thinning hair, the low energy, the constipation, stubborn weight, cold body temperature, you know, anxiety, depression, and you know that you've been on a lower carbohydrate diet for some time, it's a pretty good sign that you need to start to increase those. And it's different for everyone, but typically, especially for a menstruating woman, I would recommend no less than about 125 grams of carbohydrates a day. And if you're exercising or, you know, there's other things going on, then that would shift. So I'm not saying every single woman that's listening, 125 is for you. I'm saying I'm giving you like a general amount. Um, but if you feel like that's near, you've been struggling on, then you want to work with somebody to help you really hone in on that. I know for me, like I, I work out, I train every day. And if I don't have enough carbohydrates, my performance suffers, my recovery suffers. I don't get the gains in the muscle size, the definition and the shape that I'm looking for. you you cannot build muscle ladies, which when you're saying you want to be toned, Tone is an appearance. Tone is not actually a thing. Uh, you Tone is what we see when muscle has been built. So you actually want to add muscle tissue. And you can't do that in the absence of carbohydrates. Your body needs that. Your muscles need that glycogen. Your liver needs it. So don't be restricting all of your carbohydrates. Instead, get educated on what are the best types and the best combinations. Now, the next question is about how to help low testosterone. In fact, this woman wrote in and said, I've had testing done both in blood and the Dutch, and it came back that I literally have no testosterone. Okay, so when there is no testosterone, um, first of all, like I would want to look and see what's happening with the other uh, hormones. I would also want to see what's happening with your thyroid and your adrenals. And I would want to have a conversation with you about your level of stress, about what your health history has been. Um, you know, were you exercising intensely previously? What was actually going on? Some of the things that can help, so number one when we're talking about exercise, is to eliminate the heavy cardio and focus on strength training. Helping to increase your human growth hormone and to build that muscle is going to help to stimulate and support your testosterone as well. Now the sleep is critical. Sleep, our human growth hormone, it's stimulated in the gym, but that is just it. Like the workout is the catalyst, but then you have to feed it properly, and then the sleep is actually where the real work happens. So aiming to get really good quality sleep. What's your sleep hygiene like? Are you in total darkness? When you're going to be on things like this at night, I actually have these here to show you. So I wear true dark, mine aren't true dark, they're spectrum, but I wear blue light blockers. I know they're super sexy, but I wear these at night around the house. Um, and not even if I'm just on my device, but I wear them so that it eliminates all of that light. Right now I have a uh, night, um, flux that's on my computer so that I don't have bright light coming back at me. And so things like that, I wear a sleep mask, um, you know, taking magnesium before bed. Sometimes you might need some other things, but what is your sleep hygiene like? You can't just run to the end of the day, chase down the clock, get yourself ready for bed in bright light, and then jump into bed and expect to have a great sleep and for all of your hormones and your body to heal. It's not going to happen. You have to put the work in for that sleep. Um, the other thing that's going to help your testosterone maca is really great. Um, adaptogens in general, so rhodiola, schizandra, holy basil, these are powders you can add into elixirs, which I share all the time. Um, there's different tinctures that you can take that look like, you know, this, and it's just like the um, dropper that you could either just put into your mouth or with a little bit of water. Um, zinc, again, is really important. B vitamins, magnesium, and then sex. And I know that's a hard one because when your testosterone is low or when your hormones are off or when you don't feel like you have the energy to do anything, the thought of having sex is like, are you frigging kidding me? But the more orgasms that you have, the more intimate that you can be, you are releasing and producing dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and all of these key hormones, which these are neurotransmitters that in our brain then send messages to other parts of our body to help to support. So it might mean 
mean that, um, you know, you have to do, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be sex, although that does help. Orgasms definitely help. And that connection, but just intimacy as a whole is something else that can help to naturally raise that testosterone. Now, I have people ask all the time, can I just go and get some prescription DHEA or bioidentical testosterone? Not DHEA here in Canada. Testosterone, you could, but I would start with the lifestyle things first. And then if you've spent a solid, you know, five, six months really working on those things, then that's when I would connect with a naturopath or a functional practitioner who can actually look at all of your levels and then prescribe um, a bioidentical testosterone. Okay. How do you get this scale to move when your hormones are out of whack? You work with someone to help you get your hormones in balance and then the weight will come off. And this is the trickiest part for people to understand is that the reason our body is holding on to weight is that that is a source of inflammation. So what our body is going to respond to the information that we provide it, the resources, the raw material. So the obvious things would be, let's look at what you're eating. And a lot of people can think, well, I eat really healthy. But if you've been on a diet forever, if you're not eating enough calories, if you're not getting enough food into your body, you're not going to lose weight. On the flip side, if you are not aware and cognizant of what you're consuming at all, that can be impeding it as well too. What's your stress like? What's your sleep like? And what's going on in your body? Is there something happening in your thyroid? Is there something going on in the adrenals? Is there something systemically or chemistry-wise in your body that's preventing you from losing the weight? Now, I will tell you in running all of these tests, primarily the Dutch for Women in the Hormone Project, that the adrenals are like the master key to unlock the weight loss struggle. And as long as those adrenals are taxed and that cortisol level is, you know, either too low or too high, um, there's going to be some issues there. So I would flip your frame around that. Instead of trying to do all the things to lose weight, I would be focusing on, I'm going to start to do things that is going to give me more energy, where it's going to improve my mood. It's going to improve my sleep. I'm going to focus on all the healthy foods I get to choose to consume. I'm going to hydrate my body. I would start to do those things to actually feel better instead of that kind of dieter's lack mentality, which is everything I have to cut out, everything I'm not allowed to have, those types of things. And when you're saying when your hormones are out of whack, you need to understand which hormones are out of whack because we have over 50 hormones. And so, you know, it's not just cortisol. It's not just estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. It can be a myriad of things that are going on. And that's why it really makes sense to invest the time, the energy, and the money to work with someone to really know what's going on in your body. Okay. All right. I am making my way through these. So um, next question was... Uh, if you've had the Dutch test and your estrogen came back low, like non-existent, and you're in menopause, should you do anything to support your estrogen or just leave it? Okay, so what's important is that when you're going through perimenopause and into menopause and beyond, your ovaries are going to make less estrogen. So no matter how healthy we are as women, that's a natural part of being a woman is that at, there's going to come a time where our body is going to stop producing in our ovaries those hormones. Now, the important thing, though, is that this is where the adrenal health is so vital. We need to take care of our adrenals because when the ovary production slows down, your adrenals almost become like your secondary ovaries. And the adrenals start to produce, I mean, they've been doing it all along, but they produce a hormone called DHGA. DHEA is like the grandmother hormone that then is going to convert into estrogen so that you still have a memory, you still have mental focus, you still have cognition, you still you know, remember where your keys are, you don't have brain fog, that you still have a sex drive, you still have ambition, you don't suffer from anxiety. When women go through menopause and they weren't taking care of themselves and they were under a tremendous amount of stress and they you know, didn't recognize that the adrenals or the thyroid was an issue. And then now they have this, you know, zero production of these hormones happening, or even worse, they've had a partial or a radical hysterectomy. That is like literally the rug has been pulled out from underneath them. And that's when you just see, and I see it all the time, and I have seen it in family members, and it is really sad to see happen because it is not necessary at all. And the answer is not going directly onto hormone replacement therapy. 
it is again looking at the lifestyle it is making sure that we are nourishing and supporting your body getting the rest supporting with certain nutrients and yes potentially some bioidenticals but again only after we've done the lifestyle thing so with women who are menopausal or post who have really low estrogen this is where i'll use things like ground flaxseed which are phytoestrogens, fantastic. It also helps to keep them regular in their bowels um, to keep that elimination happening. The other thing that I will actually use is I will use some uh, cold water washed, non-genetically modified organic soy, which is rich in phytoestrogens. So I'm not part of a camp that is 100% against soy. I'm against crappy genetically modified soy. I'm against soy milk. I'm against those types of things that are not real true food. But if you really spend your time, you do the research, you read the peer review reports, and I you know, have been using this in, in my own practice with women and doing the testing and seeing what's going on, and it has made some pretty impactful changes and results for them. There's also different essential oils like clary sage, lemon balm, um, or not lemon balm, sorry, um, lemongrass, grapefruit, basil. There's different things like that. So there's a lot, there's homeopathic remedies that are wonderful to be supporting during this transition. And there is a tincture by, another one by St. Francis, I love this company, and it it is specific for menopause. And so it has things like Vitex and black cohosh. Um, and it's actually, I've started taking it and not because my menopause, I, I just turned 40 on Thursday. Um, I've got it right here. It's the one I just had up. It's the Vitex combo. But this is to help to keep those key hormones in balance so that it helps you manage that transition. And I don't know when I'll go through menopause. I don't have any signs or symptoms of it now. But my whole mentality around our health ladies is get in front of it. Like you don't want to wait until things are starting to happen. You don't want to wait until the discomfort is so uncomfortable and you've been dismissed by doctor and practitioner after practitioner where you just feel so lost. And now it feels like there are so many things you have to change and shift. Get in front of it. Like you only get one of you. You do not, it's not like your earrings and your accessories and your clothes, where if you get bored of these and these start to look crappy and tattered, you get to take them out and go and grab other ones. You don't get to open up your closet and be like, oh, there's six more just like me that are hanging up. I'm just going to unzip this crummy body and step inside of a new one. You get one. You get one. And life can change in the blink of an eye. And I'm not saying that, you know, Doing the things I'm telling you means that you're 100% guaranteed that you're going to have zero health issues. But what I'm telling you is you are going to have so much more health resiliency and you are going to have better quality of your living every day. I was having this conversation with someone the other week and they were like, oh, you know, like people, people just live so much longer now. And I was like, but do they? Like, I think people exist longer, but I don't actually know that humanity is living longer. When I look around, I there are a lot of really unwell people who are just getting through the day and you deserve more than that. Like that's not life. That is not living. You want to have good sleep, good energy. When you wake up, you want to have good thoughts. You want to be able to enjoy food without feeling like you are a prisoner to it. You want to have a menstrual cycle that you can celebrate and recognize as a woman is a gift, not a sentence, not something that keeps you in bed for two days, has you losing days at work, losing time with your kids that is taking away from how you feel. That is absolute BS to feel like as a woman that is normal and that is natural. It is not. Those are common things we're dealing with, but I'm telling you that's not normal and it does not have to be your way, but you have to choose. You have to be the one to draw the line in the sand. I could spend the next month here with you without stopping talking, giving you every tip and suggestion and solution under the sun, but I can't move in with you. I can't be the one to help you choose differently. And that's the hardest part. It's making that promise to ourselves that I'm just going to do one thing, one thing. That's all you have to start with. And the thing about, you know, creating new habits and patterns is that, or rituals, you can't just do what you see your friend or someone else doing, because then you don't have the proper intention or energy behind it. You have to ask yourself on that really deep level, what do, what am I so uncomfortable with? Like, what am I so done and over with? Or what is the thing that Jen mentioned tonight where I feel like I could start to work on that? Is it getting more vegetables in? 
Is it maybe going for the pap smear you haven't had in too long? Is it getting the updated blood work? Is it drinking more water? Is it getting to bed earlier? Is it getting off your device, right? Is it booking a, 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 with a practitioner, right? Is it applying for the hormone project? What's your thing? What is the thing that you are prepared to do in order to not feel how you have been feeling? Let me go back into my questions here that you guys submitted. Um, Okay, so there was two more here and then I'm gonna open it up for Q&A to you all. So low libido. Okay, so this kind of, we've touched on this, but stress is gonna be a big one. I know for me, like if I'm super stressed, here's how it is. A man needs very little to get stimulated. A woman, what goes on down here has to happen up here first. If this space is so full of all of the tasks and things and whatever else has got you going, you just, you can't physically get into it. And the way that our reproductive system responds is by what's happening up here. And so stress is a big one. If your thyroid is not being well supported, low sex drive is going to be there. Um, drinking alcohol, right? Too much of it, especially in the evening. I know people always say like having a drink loosens you up. Um, over time, it'll actually do the opposite. And uh, that might be something to consider. And then, you know, it's, and this is hard with libido, like it really is to the individual. The answer can be as complex as the reasons. Um, so this is something I, I have really in-depth private conversations with women in practice all the time. You know, one of the big things I'll say that I have found with women is when they give themselves permission to do something as simple as use a lubricant like coconut oil or jojoba oil, that can change a lot of the things. So many women are suffering from vaginal dryness. It makes it painful and so uncomfortable they are embarrassed or feel shame talking about that or, you know, expressing that to their partner. Like ladies, get a small glass container, keep that coconut oil next to your bed, own it like a boss and take responsibility for your own, you know, pleasure when it comes to intimacy and being in the bedroom. And you're going to notice a, a massive difference for yourself. Final question was long, heavy cycles. This was the one 10 plus days. My doctor says everything is fine. I just can't wrap my head around how you have a woman coming in that is suffering this way and you feel okay telling her everything is fine and then sending her on her way. I just, it, it like simultaneously makes me sad, infuriated, but then also so dang passionate about what I do every day and get to help women in this way because that is a crappy, that's not even an answer. It's not an answer for a woman. That's not helping her at all. And it's understanding this isn't just about her having the long, heavy period. This is 10 days of her life every single month, 120 days, four months out of her life every single year is impacted by this. And what did, that's a season. That is a full season in this woman's life is impacted by this. She deserves to actually understand what's going on. And she deserves better than being told she's normal and just fine because that's not. So I'm going to recommend you go and listen back to episode 47 on the Simplicity Sessions podcast with Amanda Lee from Sozo Method about copper toxicity. I would dig deeper into some of the things I've talked about earlier. I would do start the shepherd's purse tincture to help to, to mitigate that in the meantime. And I would recommend that you apply for the hormone project so we can do some deep work together. Um, that we start on September 30th. We're 50% full now. It is through application. So you can go to genpike.com forward slash the hormone project. You can apply to work together. Um, there's myself and Dr. Laura Anderson and you get private consults with us, the entire course curriculum. Um, the Dutch is included. If you've already done a Dutch or you don't want to, then there's a different payment fee. There's, um, you can either pay up front, you can do installments. All the information is there if you go and read about it. Um, but it is, it is, I, it is the thing that I'm most proud of is that curriculum because it is an educational system. This is not a transformation. This is not a hormone challenge. This is literally giving you your life back and it's putting you back in school and you are the subject. You are the subject. So, um, mm -hmm. all right. Okay. Let's open it up to those of you that are in here. That was all the questions. I got through all of them that were submitted. Like I said, there were so many, but a lot of them were about the same thing. So I was able to condense that in. So 
ask me your questions that you have now. And I think this has actually um, been such a good one that we've gotten through that I'm probably going to flip this into a podcast episode itself so that we can continue to share this message. So any questions about anything I did not hit on tonight? There's a little pause here as I'm waiting. And remember, there's no silly questions either. So somebody asking about, what about your teeth enamel with the lemon water and vinegar? Um, I have been doing this for a long time and I've never had an issue with it. If you're worried about it, you could sip it through a stainless steel straw. Again, it's not hot water, it's warm water. And then that way it's bypassing the teeth at all. And you could also talk to your dentist about that. What does Dandy Blend taste like? Um, so it, it tastes uh, like honestly a little bit caramely. It's like there's chicory root that is in it. Um, it's quite good. I mean, I would say that if you are trepidatious about using it, mix it into an elixir first. So elixirs are just heaven in a mug. And you would just do like a cup and a half of hot water, a little bit of non-dairy milk, tablespoon of the dandy blend, some collagen in there is fantastic. And then um, you would blend it up and it becomes frothy and delicious. And you can buy it in smaller packages. You can buy it in individual travel size packs. And uh, yeah. Any other questions? Did I cover all of your questions tonight? Everything was answered for you before we hop off here. Maybe too long, but can you explain moon cycles? That is definitely too long. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a whole ebook on it and, uh, and I have a brand new program called Synced, which is a movement based series that is all based on the four phases of your menstrual cycle and the moon cycle. Yeah. So that is like, I could do a whole nother masterclass just on that, which I probably will. Um, in the beginning of October as we start to talk about Synced because it is fascinating. It is really truly how I have lived my life in the last couple of years and it has made a tremendous, tremendous difference, not just in cycling, but just in scheduling life too. You are very welcome. Okay, ladies, you have been awesome tonight. Thank you so much for hanging with me and for asking all of your amazing questions and for being such a tentative audience. So give us a couple of days for this to get flipped back over into the recorded version and we will email it out to you. And who knows, within a couple of weeks, you might be able to listen to this as a podcast. Take care, everyone, and uh, I will see you next time. Have a great night.